you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians chapter 3. We will continue uh, the go from the text that we've been going from, and we're talking about really the Christian home. And for those of you who have not been here, we've been preaching through the book of Colossians, and we're talking about the priority of Christ in every area of our life because that's the theme of the book. Uh, we know in chapter 1, verse 18, at the verse, end of verse 18, Christ is preeminent over all. But in the church, he's preeminent in all and over all. And if that is true, what impact should that have on our lives? Chapter 3 tells us that we are new men, new women, new creations. We are not what we used to be. Therefore, we cannot live and behave and think like we used to think. We are now seeking things that are above and not things of the earth. We are not prioritized and controlled about what's going on down here, we get our marching orders from heaven. And the way that we know what's going on in heaven, God has revealed it in Genesis through Revelation. And the church is to be the reflection of those marching orders so that people can see God's will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. That does not make us perfect people, but it makes us people who are being perfected. And we talked about in this Christian home, it starts with the men, the men understanding their role, their function as the head of the home, as Christ is the head of the church. And it is followed by women understanding their role. They are to be submissive to their husbands in the things that pertain to the things of the Lord, as the church is to be submissive to Christ, who is the head of the church. But equally, we are to, based on Ephesians chapter 5, to be submissive to one another. And we are submissive to one another in the home when we fulfill our God-ordained roles in the home. We are submissive to the head of Christ when we are fulfilling our God-ordained roles in the culture or in public life or in work life, as we will see next time we get together. But it's all based upon the fact that you are a new man, that you are not what you used to be. Therefore, everything you touch, every area of your life is to reflect that newness, that we are to reflect not the vices of the old man, but we are to reflect the virtues of the new man, chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. And the big picture, brothers and sisters, is that that what we have been made because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because we belong to the body of Christ, because we are the bride of Christ, how we live and how we move and have our being is to be radically different than those who do not know Christ. But the problem in our modern day culture is we look too much like the world. We respond too much like the world. Our marriages look too much like those who don't know Christ. Our singlehood looks too much like people who don't know Christ. Our children look too much like people who don't know Christ. Our churches look too much like organizations that are not headed by Christ. And that is not to be the case. But let me say something more definitively. It is not the case for the church which Christ is the head of. The only way we cannot look like what we've been made to look like is that Christ is not the head. Let me put it in another way that might hit you another way. Just because you're a new man or a new woman don't mean you can live out what we're learning in the scriptures. Because without the feeling, the power of the Holy Spirit, even though you're new, You can't manifest it. Oh, I wish somebody was here with me this morning. You see, it is possible for me to build you a house, which you really don't want me to do, but follow the illustration, and to wire the house properly and to connect the house to the power that is on the pole so that you have the availability to all the power you need to run everything in your household. But if you don't ever flip on the switch, if you don't ever turn the knob, if you don't ever plug in the appliance, 
having a brand new house that is rightly wired and rightly connected doesn't get the power in your life. Oh, somebody ain't praying with me this morning. It is possible to be new and not look and act new. Because Ephesians chapter 5 which you have to really read these two books together, says you must be filled with the Spirit before he ever begins to talk about marriage and the role of the husband and the role of the wife and the role of the children and the role of the slave and the servant and the master and how we are to act in public life. And I'm afraid that our churches are filled with people who aren't even born again but on top of that, it's filled with people who are not rightly connected, who are not being filled, even though they may be saved. And you still don't get to see what the world needs to see, people who live radically different, who marriages are radically different, who, who are different men and different women and have different children and have different homes and are different on their jobs and are different in the public square. Pastor Strong is doing a great job of challenging you guys in the morning. He's trying to wake you up. Because if you read Ephesians 5, chapter 5, the problem is some people are slumbering. They're not awake. They're not just napping physically, they asleep spiritually. It's not that they don't come to the household of God. It's not that they don't get the instructions that they need. It's not that they're not getting the information that they need. They're just asleep. And if they are awake, they're not connected. And if they're connected, they don't ever turn on the switch. To get the power from heaven flowing through the hookup of the new man or new woman. I'm trying to help somebody this morning. This text this morning deals with child rearing or parenting or raising children. But it talks about how it looks when new men, new women are raising new children. Men and women, boys and girls who have been born from above, who are saved, who are being sanctified, who are serving and sacrificing and seeking the things that are above. Does your home, does my home, does your marriage, does your role and function do your children look like what we're going to talk about this morning? While I want to do some exposition, I also want to do some healing. Because I know some of you have been hurt, wounded, scarred by the type of home you were raised in or that you weren't raised in. And you're carrying some of that luggage even to this day. But can I tell you something? New people don't let old stuff keep them from acting like new people. I know some of you are wounded. I know some of you have been scarred. I know some of you have been injured by your past and the home you were raised in by the kind of father you did or did not have, the kind of mother you did or did not have. But the day you got saved, all that was supposed to change. Because you are not what you were, therefore you cannot be affected by what you did or didn't experience. But if you just hardwired right, but you ain't connected. If you're hardwired and you're connected, but you don't ever flip the switch. You may not be experiencing this as your reality. But we're going to try to get you right this morning, all right? 
Now, I, I need to disqualify myself. I, I, I am not the perfect parent. I have not been the perfect parent. I, I told you I wasn't the perfect husband. I have not been the perfect husband. And I, I, as lovely as my wife is, she hasn't been the perfect wife because we are all still being perfected. We've made some mistakes. We've not done some things as I've grown in the word of God and grown in the knowledge of the word of God. There are some things I wish I could go back and change, but I can't go back and change them. All I can do is start doing now what I understand. I can't go back and make my kids small and get a redo. But I can start doing what I'm learning and growing and maturing in. Oh, I'm trying to free some people this morning. You can't go back and fix what you didn't do. But you can start doing what you should have been doing the whole time. Some people will say that's why you get grandkids, so you can do what you didn't do with the kids before they mess up the kids like you messed up your kids. That's your redo. That's why some of you who have grandchildren ought to be getting them in the car and bringing them to church so you can get a redo because you didn't do that. Oh, Pastor, you was doing good till you got to that point. But I see that in my own life. I see that as a pastor. As I grow and mature as a pastor, I'm learning to do things that I didn't know how to do well when I first started. And God gives me redos because we keep getting new people. And I keep some of the same people. It's like parenting. And I have the same issues with the big group that I had with the small group. That's why Paul tells Timothy one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he must know how to what? Manage his own household well. It's not that he has a perfect house. It's how does he manage his household? Does he manage it according to the word of God? It's not a guarantee of results. But it is a mandate of managing. Because those are little individual people who I can't make do anything, I can simply make sure I've set up an environment that is conducive for God to work in. Are y'all with me this morning? That's why husbands have got to do their role and their function. That's why wives got to do their role and their function, and now we come to the children. Now, I must ask a question to get you in the text because some of you will eliminate yourself from the text because some of you are thinking about little ones. Is there anybody in here who was not born out of the womb of a woman? Would you please raise your hand? Then you are a child. You are somebody's child. Even if you're a parent, you're somebody's child. See, some of you can't get right with your kids because you are, have not been right with your parents. And God works in a hierarchy. God works in a flow of structure. You're bitter, you're angry about what your parents did to you and you think that won't spill out into your kids. Because you never got healed yourself. Uh -uh. You got sibling rivalry with your brothers and your sisters. Wondering why your kids don't get along. Hello. And if your kids happen to get along, that's by the grace of God. Because you know you're not right with some people in your own family. See, sometimes we get blessed because of God's grace, not because we write. 
And that's dangerous because you see the blessing and you think you a okay and you're not a okay. You only know if you're a okay when you're lining up with the. My purpose this morning is to call parents and children to reflect the priority of Christ in the new family. You, your family shouldn't look like people who don't know Christ. Your family shouldn't be functioning like people who are under the first Adam when you're under the second Adam. Your, your, your family shouldn't be full of hatred and bitterness and anger and all kinds of sexual immorality and, and crime and drugs. That's the old Adam. But under the new Adam, there ought to be tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, forgiveness of one another, love. That is the love that God demonstrated for us and demonstrates for us each and every day. That's the new man. But brothers, sisters, the modern day church walks around about the sinfulness of our past and our present like it's some kind of badge of honor. There's no brokenness, there's no humility, there's no humbleness, there's no repentance. We talk more about sin than we talk about holiness. That's not the new man or the new woman, the new creation. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what goes on in the dark, deep wretches of your own heart, mind, and soul. The problem is you don't like the word of God going places you don't want it to go. Unlocking rooms you didn't lock up and put on lockdown. Well, you need to find another church. Because all we got for you here is the word of God. There are two principles related to healthy parenting and childhood. As I said, I'm not an expert on these things, but I'm, I'm going to show you what the expert has said. There is no manual that comes out the womb when you have children on how to raise your child. But there is a book that was inspired by God that tells you how to raise your child. Amen. And it's got two very important books that really focuses on that, even though the whole book does. There are two books that will be indispensable to you. The book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastics. Amen. Amen. Before you go read Dr. Spock, you need to read Dr. God. Before you go and listen to all these TV gurus, you need to go talk to Dr. Jesus. Before you tune in to all those shows that are whacked, you need to tune in to the scriptures that are holy. I was thinking about this Friday and working through this and Sister Cup, my big sister in the Lord, is always buying me new Bibles. I got a Reformation Bible, I got a Life Bible, I got uh, this Bible, that Bible. She just keeps collecting Bibles for me and I keep reading them. <laughs> looking at this one and looking at that one and looking at this one and looking at that one. And I found this in the Reformation Bible and I thought it would be helpful for you. The book of Proverbs, a proverb, and we've talked about this as when we preach through Proverbs, is a short saying often based on observing creation that presents a truth that is generally applicable in most situations. You can just observe life and see if there's a problem. You just watch social media and Twitter and TikTok and all this other stuff. Just look at the music arena and the movies. Go to your local elementary school and junior high school and high school, and you can see just from observing life, there are problems. And it's applicable to all situations. 
But Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, tells you that before you go look. And it is a book of wisdom. Wisdom is this, the skill rooted in the worship of God to live a successful life as defined by God. Listen, wisdom is taking God's word and walking it out and living it out in the practical areas of life. If you are not doing that, if I am not doing that, if we are not doing that as a church, we don't have wisdom. We may have information. And we got information overload. But one of the things we don't have in our culture is wisdom. Too much foolishness. And you only got two choices. See, y'all used to go into all these restaurants with all these choices. The Bible says there's two choices. Either you have wisdom or you have foolishness. Either you're raising wise children or you're raising foolish children. There are no other categories. Now, there may be levels of wisdom, and there may be levels of foolishness, but there's wisdom and foolishness. Foolishness. Here's a definition. The way of life characterized by those who do not fear God or follow his instructions. Now, if we are people of wisdom, and the definition for wisdom is the opposite of the definition of foolishness, how you get both ends? But see, when you have a culture, a church culture, when you can be half saved and somewhat not saved, then you can have wisdom and foolishness in the same household, in the same mind. But if the definitions are totally contradictory to one another, you can't have both. You can't have wisdom being living life by the instruction of God's word and foolishness are those who don't fear God and don't live by God's word and say you both wise and foolish depending on which side of the bed you get out on in the morning. You are either wise or foolish. You are either raising wise children or foolish children. Listen to this. We read this on Wednesday night, but some of you weren't here, so we'll read it again. It comes from the book that we're going through on Wednesday night. The author says, the undeniable consequence of our urban family crisis is a generation that has abandoned the Christian faith. It's, it's not Washington. It's not politics. It's not the past presidents or Democrats or Republicans. We have left God. We are in a nation that has left God, and we are in a church age that has left God. But we haven't left church. Y'all get that over lunch. The church has attempted to solve the puzzle of unchristian generation wires, also called millennials, with little to no success. Vody Bachman Jr. laments his point in his landmark book, Family Driven Faith. And he says this, anyone who has been paying attention lately is aware of the startling statistics concerning Christians. Children leaving the faith, depending on the study, we are losing the vast majority of teens raised in evangelical homes. I would like to adjust that. We've been, we're raising them in church going homes. But there's no church at home. Listen. He says, I believe we are looking for answers in all the wrong places. Our children are not falling away because the church is doing a poor job. Our children are falling away because we are asking the church to do what God designed the family to accomplish. You got your children six days of the week. We get them just on Sunday, and you expect them to fi us to fix them for you. Why does your child got to come to Sunday school class so the Sunday school teacher can lead him to Christ? Uh, why is the Sunday school teacher only one teaching them scripture? Amen. 
Discipleship and multi-generational faithfulness begins and ends at the home. The problem of our culture is a problem of our homes. But let's bring that down to a little bit, little narrow view. The problem of our churches is the problem of our homes. Because if you got weak families, you're going to have weak churches. And then that multiplies into a culture and society. If we're going to have strong churches, we got to have strong homes. And men, you got to lead. We, we saw that previously, right? I only got two points for you this morning, but they load it. <laughs> My first point is the message to the children, verse 20 in Colossians chapter 3, and then the message to the parents, verse 21, Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at the message to the children. Now, I, I've already defined to you who the children are, but let me clarify it a little bit. Who are the children? Look at, look at verse 20. Children, stop, slow down. Do not pass, go. Children, who are the children? Because see, some of y'all think y'all grown. <laughs> Living under your parents' roof. But one of the things I've learned is that some of you are grown physically, but you're still a child mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You're a child. But you think because you got physical maturity that you've grown. But you act like a child. Children. I'm, I'm trying to find who the children are because y'all don't get it. If you live under your mama and daddy's roof still, you are in the category of a child. But just because you move out on your own don't mean you've grown either. The Greek word is techna. It's a general term for children, and it's not limited to a specific age group. So he's not limited to a specific. We think little children. No, that's a different Greek word. He's just talking about children. Anybody that's got parents or has had parents is in this category. So all of us up in this text. Pastor, when you going to get to the kids? Ooh, he finally getting to the kids. Nope, don't, don't, don't leave the sermon. Don't be looking at them talking about he talking to y'all. If you have parents or have had parents, this is the one that's for you. Because some of the little kids are jacked up because the big kids are jacked up. Kids raising kids. Because you think you got certain body parts, you've grown. As immature as the day is long. Don't know what life is about. Don't know what the meaning of life is about. Don't know what the purpose of life is about. Don't know what you're supposed to be doing. That's a child. Don't have your passions under control. Don't have your mind under control. Don't have your... This word in the Greek was used of any child living at a home under their parents' guidance or under their roof. This is a third relationship in the home. What do you mean third relationship? You, all you've talked about is husband and wife. Why do you get third relationship? Because all relationships starts with having a relationship with God because you can't be a new man until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first relationship that controls every other relationship. And if I don't have that one, anything I said about husband and wives and what I'm getting ready to say about kids won't work. We're talking about new men and new women. We're talking about new creation living. We're talking about what it really means to be a Christian, a disciple, a follower, a learner created in the image of Jesus Christ. That's more than just going to church. That's more than knowing some scriptures that you don't even do. Mm -hmm. 
what are children to do is the next question. We've defined who they are. Everybody got who they are? If you got who they are, say amen. amen. But what are they to do? Look at verse 20. Children, obey your parents. Oh, y'all ready to jump in all things? No, slow down. Obey your parents. For you who are physically mature, what does it look like when you go to your parents' house? What do your little children see? What have they seen? I remember Dr. Evans preaching on text similar to this, talked about when he took his kids when they were little to his parents' house and they would be at the dinner table and, 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 and he would correct one of his children and his dad would say, leave that boy alone. And Tony would say, that's my kid. And his dad would say, but you're in my house. Y'all been fussing and arguing. And your kids have been watching. Mm-hmm. When it come they turn to submit to their parents, look at how they act. But then when I'm at home and don't do what they say, y'all know what I'm talking about. And then you wonder why those little rebellious children get that rebellion from. They've been watching you. They've been watching the world. They've been watching those TV shows. They've been listening to those songs. They've been being shaped and molded by foolishness and not wisdom. And as we learn, it provokes them, it exacerbates them, it irritates them. And new men and new women shouldn't be doing that to their children. We'll get there. The word obey lacks the voluntary sense found in the command to be submissive. When it talks about women submit to their husbands, it's supposed to be what? Voluntary willful submission. Not so here. Not so here. They don't get to volunteer. They obey. It's a command. It's a command for the woman, but it's willing submission, not having to be made to, but you may have to make your children obey. There's a difference. This is how they please the Lord and validate that they are new creations or new men. The way that you test whether a little one, come, come close now, I'm going I'm to help you out. The way that you know that your little baby has confessed faith in Jesus Christ is you look at their life of obedience. Because the Holy Spirit is not age appropriate. Just because you're an adult don't mean you get more Holy Spirit than a little kid does. It's the same Holy Spirit that produces the same virtues and not the old vices. You don't know whether your kids are saved because they can recite certain scriptures. You recite scripture and you barely act say That's not the test. The test is what? Obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, Jesus said. That goes for little kids, middle kids, upper kids, and older kids. We've taken obedience and thrown it right out the window. Y'all take them pictures on Easter and Christmas, and, and then they turn up the classroom on Monday through Saturday. Ooh, they love Jesus. Look, look at that little glowing face. They look like little angels. They glow all week long like the devil. When they ain't around you, they run into your house, ripping and running, jumping up on the furniture, running across the couch, telling you, no, I ain't going to do that. And then you send them off to school, and if they say something to them, you got the nerve to go up there and want to throw a fit. Don't be touching my kid. Somebody better touch them. You ain't touching them. You're not setting any boundaries. You better hope the teacher get to them before the policeman does. 
before the court system does, before somebody else's kid who running rampant does. Because foolishness just produces more foolishness. The present tense of the imperative here is be obedient or be being obedient demands a continuous obedience. It's not a sometimey. It's not when they at church. It's all the time. See, we as adults haven't learned this. And you can't pass on what you don't know yourself. Is this your experience as a parent? You've been saved since you're 12, and you still ain't got it down yet. Well, it's a process. We didn't talk about that process thing, have we, right here in Colossians? The progression is you're putting to death the members of your flesh, you're putting off the old, and you're putting on the new. And if you are continuously doing that, why is it taking so long? Listen to these scriptures. Mark them down. They're in the notes. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Wherever the Lord puts you, we are to be as the children of God, the people of God, producing children who honor and obey God and reflect that honor and obedience to God in honoring and obeying their parents. Whatever century, whatever era, whatever dispensation, whatever time period, this is new man, new person living. What happens when they don't look like that? Exodus chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. We read it in the scripture here, but here we go. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. This is Old Testament. But it has a New Testament reality, too. See, the reason why a lot of our kids are dying young is because they're disobeying. Stop believing the news. The Bible is true. Disobedience produces death. And it starts in the home. Verse 17 says, and he who curses his father just talks back to him, gives him lip. We see this stuff on TikTok and YouTube, and we think it's cute. It ain't cute. Oh, he's just showing his little personality. Yeah, that he's unsaved, that he's born in sin, shaped in iniquity by his very nature, a child of wrath. And you think that's cute? It's not cute. It's devilish. And when you get a culture full of people like this, you get a society full of people like this, you get homes that are keep producing these kind of people, Washington can't fix that because it's a heart issue. It's a, it's a dead in sins and trespasses issue. Washington can raise up people in new life. That's the church's job in proclaiming the gospel. And we're not doing our job. But we're complaining about the society. Deuteronomy 21, 18, 20. Listen to the rule God gave his people in Israel. If any man has a stubborn, and rebellious son or daughter who will not obey his father and his mother... And when they chastise him, he will not even listen to him. Don't bring your people, your kids, to the leaders of the church and you ain't chastise them first. Some of y'all know y'all got kids living in sin, you ain't saying a mumbling thing. Well, you saying a mumbling thing, you ain't saying the right thing. You say, 
Now you know better than that. Is that what the Bible said you're supposed to say to him? You know you shouldn't be shacking up together. Is that what the Bible said you should say to him? You know you shouldn't be sleeping with somebody you ain't. Is that what the Bible said you should be saying to him? They on drugs. Well, you know drugs ain't good. Is that what the Bible says you should be saying to them? And you keep letting them come over thinking their life is all right because they get to keep having a fellowship with you. Yeah, but they say they're a Christian. What you doing having fellowship with them? Mm-mm. I saw some of y'all faces just go, I don't like you right about now. Then you need to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. What does light have to do with darkness? What does Belial have to do with Christ? How are you going to have partnership and fellowship with people who are totally opposite? Mm-hmm. But wait a minute. They my blood. That's my baby. That's my child. That's my little coochie, coochie, coo coo. What does Vody Bakken call them? Vipers and diapers. And they go from diapers to pans, from pans to suits, from suits. And now they've gone from pans to droop. Because somebody went at home telling, boy, put your pants up. Put a belt on. This is the style. This is God's house. We don't wear droopy pants in God's house. It says, when they don't obey and when they don't listen to the discipline that you bring about, verse 19, then his father and mother shall seize him. Uh uh-uh. uh. Y'all know what C's mean, don't you? Just think about when you get really mad at them and you reach out and touch them. You're supposed to grab them, put them in the car, and drive them to the leaders of the church. This is what they did in Israel the elders of the gate, those were the leaders of Israel. This is what we call the New Testament church discipline. This was Israel discipline here. We got church discipline in the New Testament. He says, and bring them out to the elders of the city of the gateway of his hometown. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Sexually immoral. That's not in there, but that's included. Then all the men of the city shall stone him. Lord, have mercy. Do you know you don't read much about kids getting stoned in the Bible because kids wasn't crazy back then? They crazy now because they don't believe anything will happen to them. But all this had to do was happen one time in Israel. It got kids' attention. It got parents' attention because it was done publicly. It wasn't done hush-hush. You bring them out before her, and then all the men of the city get stones and stone them to death. You think that'll cut down on crime? Kids ain't afraid for you to house them in a jail. They didn't want to be at home anyway. I'm going to get three square reels a day. I'm going to get my own room. And in today's prison, I can get a degree. We get to play ping pong and basketball. Ooh, that don't sound like punishment to me. Start stoning people to death and see if they stop going to jail. But see, jail is big business today. It's good white-collar money-making entity. It ain't really about deterring crime. It's about making money. Try this one on for size and see if the crime rate don't go down. See if the drug rate don't go down. 
See if the game banging rate don't go down. See if the graffiti rate don't go down. That's why you have government to do this. But in the church, among God's people, we supposed to be doing that. But some of y'all got kids, they gone so far left, and we ain't heard peep. Let me tell you something. The text says the parents have to do their part first before the church gets involved. Pastor, you know they ain't living right. Yeah, I know it, but what you doing? And if you don't care, why am I supposed to care? There's a process to this. Y'all like processes, right? There are steps to this. We can't get, skip the steps. Because in Israel, when you had parents that didn't do this, then the parents got in trouble. Now, we want, we, this is family business. We're going to keep it hush, hush. <laughs> Pastor John told y'all, we ain't disconnected from one another. We're family. We don't even understand church anymore. 